Good afternoon, welcome back. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Faisal Devji, uh, who's been with us at Gyan Prabha several times. Uh, Dr. Devji is university reader in modern South Asian history at the University of Oxford. He's the director of the Asian Studies Center. He's held faculty positions at the New School in New York. And he's a fellow at New York University's Institute of Public Knowledge. Uh, Dr. Devji is the author of four books, the latest being The Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea. He's interested in Indian political thought as well as that of modern Islam. Dr. Devji's broader concerns have to do with ethics and violence in a globalized world. Thank you very much. Um, since I'm not a student either of psychoanalysis or Marxism, though I must confess I had a communist upbringing or childhood, um, I thought I'd begin um, in native mode, though not necessarily as a native informant, with a quotation from a 19th century uh, Indian poet whom all the Indians in this room will have heard of, uh, Ghaleb of Delhi. Um, Khuda ke vaste parda na kabe se utha e vaiz. Khuda ke vaste parda na kabe se utha e vaiz. Kahi aisa na ho, ya bhi vahi kafir sanam nikle. For God's sake, preacher man, do not lift the Kaaba's veil, lest that infidel idol be discovered underneath. Now, as you know, the Kaaba is the central point of Islam, uh, situated in Mecca. It is a cube-shaped building draped with a black cloth, and Muslims, when they pray, face towards it. Uh, and so what Ghalib is doing is comparing the Kaaba to a woman, a veiled woman, and telling the Muslim preacher uh, that if he should lift her veil, uh, that very idol uh, of which the Kaaba had been supposedly cleansed by Muhammad uh, would appear here as well. Now, the, in one sense, Ghalib is performing a kind of fairly commonplace move because in the tradition of Urdu and Persian poetry, it is entirely routine to contrast the dry and arid legalism of Islam with the, uh, the spiritual as well as erotic richness of the idol and of infidelity. Uh, and always valorizing one, the infidel, over the other, uh, Islam. Uh, it's a tradition which has continued uh, down to some degree even to our own time. So even in the poetry of someone like Khomeini, you have this sort of thing. Right, where the, the realm of inner liberty is and can only be the realm of idolatry and paganism. Uh, and and the, 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 um, the truth of Islam is therefore, and its secret is therefore that of infidelity and idolatry. So that is quite commonplace. But one of the things Ghalib is doing in his couplet is uh, rather than mounting a contrast between Islam and its legalism on the one hand and idolatry and infidelity on the other, he's actually saying that they are both the same thing. Um, that when you destroy the idol, uh, that's when idolatry comes to exist. Uh, it can only come to exist within Islam. It doesn't actually pre-exist it. Uh, so with the removal of the, as it were, physical idol from the Kaaba, the Kaaba itself becomes an idol. Uh, it's not something that can ever be gotten rid of. Uh, now, the word nikle in the verse, which means to come forth, the idol's coming forth, or it's, I translate it as discovery, its appearance also means to leave. Um, so that the lifting of the Kaaba's veil not only exposes the idol, but in the act of exposure, it disappears, it goes elsewhere. Um, it can only exist as a secret, uh, and once it's seen, it goes elsewhere. Now, what I want to do is, um, after that somewhat lengthy preamble, uh, which is about the, the um, contrast between the inner truth of Islam and its outer reality, is to 
see how this narrative of idolatry uh, is transformed um, when Islam is, if you will, subjectivized in capitalism. Uh, just sticking to the role that the figure of the idol plays in the narrative of truth and falsehood, universality, and particularity. Um, so quite apart from Ghalib's metaphysical world, uh, you have around the tail end of his life in the second half of the 19th century, a new way of thinking about idolatry, uh, which has to do with um, recognizing that it exists everywhere, but precisely because it has already been destroyed, precisely because it is no longer vested in the form of the idol the originary form of the idol that Muhammad must have destroyed, or indeed any other idols that exist um, in temples. Uh, so you have Muslim intellectuals uh, obsessively returning to this theme of uh, uh, commodities are idols. This, of course, is it's very easy to say that this is a, a version of thinking about the commodity fetish uh, that uh, uh, they see idolatry everywhere. Any apparently excessive relationship or attachment to uh, a form of ritual, including a Muslim ritual, uh, a form of practice, uh, forms of pleasure, can and were de defined as idolatrous. All right? um, and the problem, of course, is that this ends up putting Islam and its rituals uh, itself or themselves at risk. So I'll, I'll come to that um, soon. Uh, but to begin with, I just want to say how it is. And this is um, some, you know, taking off on something that William said in his talk uh, just this morning, you know, this Weberian truism of, in this case, how modern Islam is uh, created in the joining up of capitalism and Puritanism. Uh, so that you can read it from either direction and it goes to the other, from one pole to the other and back again. Uh, and of this, these Muslim thinkers of the, from the late 19th century onwards are fully conscious. Um, uh, so it's not accidental that even those we consider uh, in today's terminology moderate and liberal and pro-Western have exactly the same narrative about idolatry that as those we see as puritanical, uh, fundamentalist, Wahhabi, etc., Salafi, to use, again, contemporary terminology for them. In both cases, there's a distrust of objects of materiality um, as being potentially, if not actually, idolatrous, uh, and the desire for infinite circulation and abstraction. And you see this coming together in the way in which um, certainly by the 20th century or say around the time of independence in these countries like India and Pakistan where there is a huge investment in um, abstract art and modernist architecture um, which is seen, both of which are seen as being quite true to the ethos and spirit of Islam as an abstract form uh, that despises um, idolatry of various kinds. Clean lines, abstract, you know, calligraphy comes to be the primary form, but also abstract art in general. Uh, and perhaps it's not, no accident, the, the, as it were, the overabundance of Muslims in abstract art, uh, even in India, um, in, in, in this city in particular. Um, M.F. Hussein, of course, is one, and Tayyab Mehta is another, and there are, there are, there are others. Uh, so the coming together of these two um, uh, is, um, um, is this sine qua non, in a way, of uh, this narrative of idolatry that I want to explore. So having dispensed with its as if it original, uh, idolatry becomes generalized not through metaphor really, but through analogy or simile, um, uh, in such a way as I was suggesting as to put at risk Islam itself and its practices. All right? So just to offer you some examples, 
the way in which, if you were to go to Saudi Arabia today, and I had the fortune or misfortune of doing so last year, um, you will note that um, the great sites of pilgrimage, including the Kaaba, have been not the Kaaba itself just yet, but all the rest of it has either been destroyed or transformed, not simply because uh, an ex architectural expansion is required to service the increasing flow of pilgrims, but precisely because these structures, which are the very center of Islamic ritual, are seen as being idolatrous, that there is an excess of devotion paid to them, which can only be understood as idolatry. Uh, so the vanished idol, the original idol Ghalib spoke of, um, uh, reappears everywhere, uh, and especially in the form of Islam itself. Um, so what the uh, Saudis have done in Mecca, for instance, destroyed the Prophet's house, destroyed the houses of his family, uh, put a block of toilets on the site where the Prophet's house uh, stood, uh, and their moves to think about destroying or remaking the Kaaba itself, that very central site of Islam, to destroy it and remake a kind of ersatz Kaaba, which then if you were to, you couldn't, on this assumption, worship it. Or if you did, it would be something quite different you were doing. Um, so that on the one hand. On the other hand, the, this obsession or anxiety over idolatry within Islam uh, ends up in the possible destruction of, destruction of the Muslim subject itself uh, in a kind of auto-destruction or self-destruction. And this is one way in which you might be able to see the sacrificial themes that are so prevalent in uh, contemporary forms of militancy and terrorism, of suicide bombing, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the scholarship such as it is on these uh, um, practices uh, is terribly flat-footed, uh, and it tends to be about you know, cost-effectiveness, um, uh, or at most about ideas of uh, rapture, all right, uh, through the, and, and apocalypse. I don't think it's about apocalypse at all, actually. I think the apocalyptic thing is a quite different um, narrative here and is not really brought out, including in the, in the sort of famous ISIS um, story. Uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, the Muslim subject also needs to be destroyed because it ends up becoming an idol. It becomes an idol for itself or for others. Um, and this poses, as, I was, as I've been saying, uh, a huge problem. Uh, so when you have freed the idol by destroying it, and it appears everywhere, uh, when you have privileged circulation and abstraction over all else, then of course, how do you retain what is proper to Islam? What is proper to Islam? Um, this, I think, leads to a crisis where figures like the Prophet in particular, and I'll say why it's the Prophet, but also to some degree God, have to be removed from this kind of circulation um, and its logic of equivalence, of general equivalence, while at the same time being protected from fetishism. Right? If, the, if the whole argument about circulation and abstraction was that it eliminated idolatry, which belonged to what was apparently stationary, material, uh, and form-filled, uh, how do you actually withdraw these objects, these entities from circulation, and yet deny them the possibility of becoming idols, according to this logic itself? Um, and you see this happening in the kinds of um, uh, acts and ideas and practices that I've, I've just been describing, huge anxiety over tomb worship, supposedly. You know, can you really pay obeisance to? You know, what is, how appropriate is it when you go to Medina to, to pay your respects to the prophet who's lying in his tomb there? Uh, and there have indeed been uh, suggestions that the prophet should not be placed in this tomb. He should actually be removed from his tomb and buried in an anonymous grave so that none should actually be able to find him uh, and pay any kind of excessive devotion to him that might be construed as idolatry. This has already been done to the bodies of 
uh, many of his family members. Though it's been understood by scholars and others in, a, in purely sectarian terms that this is a Wahhabi, Sunni act to destroy Shiite uh, reverences. I don't think it can only be that. Uh, I think the narrative of idolatry um, is far stronger than the sectarian dimension or appearance that it takes, which it of course does on occasion, but it's not defined by it. So that the prophet has to be removed from, from circulation and yet also uh, be refused the status of idol or fetish, which makes him interestingly into a kind of mortal and vulnerable figure. Uh, his importance is precisely that he's human. He's not, he doesn't share in anything divine. Uh, and modern identifications of the prophet tend to be of this kind. The prophet suddenly cannot protect you, but you need to protect him. Um, uh, if he's not to be an idol, he must be your ward in some sense. Uh, uh, and so many of the controversies over insults to the prophet, to which I will come, to which I will return, uh, envisage him in this manner, right? The prophet as a purely human being, as a vulnerable being, who can therefore be compared to one's own relatives. He's like my father, like my uncle. From the period of the Rushdie affair in 1989 till today, when people are interviewed uh, around the world uh, about why they think the prophet has been insulted, it's not because he's a sacred character necessarily. It's quite, it's interesting how that happens and I will, I want to come to that, this, this strange form of identification, withdrawal from circulation without, or apparently without, uh, fetishism. So, in some sense, if I'm correct, the first great controversy over insults to the Prophet happened in this very city, in Bombay, in 1851, in the declining years of Ghalib. And that's not accidental. Bombay, of course, had no prehistory, Indian prehistory. It's a purely British city. It was a city built for capital, um, like Johannesburg, uh, like Calcutta, like Madras. Uh, all these port, these great uh, port city. Uh, Johannesburg, of course, is not a port city. It's about mining. But all these other great port cities, which are about shipping and commodities. Um, and so Bombay is possibly the first place in India in which a kind of capitalist sphere and public are created. Uh, and I would like to suggest that these controversies over insults to the prophet are linked to this in, in some fashion. So in Bombay, in, but it's quite interesting how this happened. So in Bombay, in both 1851 and in 1874, you have riots over insults to the prophet. The first one has to do with the publication of a pamphlet, which is not meant to be insulting, it's biographies of great men. And these biographies are prefaced, these are lithographed, uh, or they might be printed actually, texts, which have these line drawings of the revered figures. In this case, it's not the image that is the problem. It's not like Muslims are protesting that the prophet has been portrayed. On the contrary, there has been a misprint of some kind, so that his face is sort of stricken, you know, I mean, there is, He's, he's made to look satanic in that way. And so there's a riot over this. So the importance here is to note that it actually isn't about the particularity of an image. Um, it's about the insult precisely done to that image. In 1874, another such pamphlet, uh, there, of course, it's the text, it's a narrative. The, um, again, not meant to be particularly insulting, just retrieving or well-known Orientalist stereotypes about the sensuality of the prophet. In both these cases, the publishers are Parsis. So the first riots are not Hindu-Muslim riots. They're Hindu, uh, they're Muslim Zoroastrian riots. This is important not only because the Zoroastrians are an important community who come, after all, from Iran, so they're coming from the Middle East. Um, uh, in some ways, they are more, in quotes, Muslim than the Indian Muslims. Uh, they will have knowledge of Middle Eastern languages that the Indian Muslims don't, for instance. Uh, but also because the Parsis are seen as the first modern community, uh, the first capitalist community to take to modern capitalist ways of comportment, of family life, of economy, of all of these things. Uh, 
in one sense, they become the models for modernity for other trading groups, including Muslim ones in this city. But for me, the important thing is, you know, how do you break through the now received antagonism of Hindu and Muslim, the two great religious communities in this country? Um, it's about capitalism and circulation rather than about the particularity of an image or the, the narrative of a text. Uh, and it is this which makes the Parsis important. It is this which makes the circulation of print, printed materials, uh, important. Uh, and not anything particularly theological. Uh, indeed, from 1851 and uh, 1874 to 1989, when you have the globalization of protest with the satanic verses, theology has never been an important aspect of the controversy. Um, it's always been insult and hurt and claims for justice. The language has been entirely, if you will, capitalist secular. It's never been. The theological language comes in from Europe. Right? So if you look at the Rushdie affair, uh, not only are sort of European commentators going on about blasphemy, etc., uh, but when their Muslim antagonists take them up on it, they do so precisely and exactly by reference to those European categories. So the blas famous blasphemy law now rescinded that Britain had on the books to protect the Anglican Church. That is their reference. Their reference is never to an Islamic text. It's always to the British law. That has now been rescinded. Today, you have countries like Pakistan uh, which want to enshrine blasphemy as a crime globally through the UN but their point of reference, its point of reference, is the Irish blasphemy law. It is not an Islamic text. So in all these controversies, certainly in South Asia, there is no theological term used. It's always Gustahi Rasul, Risalat, Tawheen Rasul, the insult. These are secular, these are everyday words. These are not words that are used uh, of uh, you know, religious figures. They are obviously used for them as they are for Muhammad but there is no theological character to them. So one of the questions that I want to ask is in what way is the theological uh, um, a, a kind of, what is it? Is it, a, is, it a, uh, is it a logic of supplementarity that is being exercised here? Um, uh, is it the logic of uh, surplus that is manifesting itself in the, in the belated um, taking up of the figure of the, theo of, of the theological when talking about insults to the prophet. Um, even uh, when the satanic, you know, Rushdie himself seems to have been fooled by this. So, you know, as you know, he writes the satanic verses, which is about a theological, among other things. It's, it's, at its core lies a theological problem, that of the satanic verses, precisely. These verses in the Quran that were meant to have, that once existed, uh, and were meant to have been uh, interpolations by Satan and therefore were withdrawn. Uh, so it's about verses that don't actually exist. It's self an interesting uh, point. Uh, this problem never becomes a problem in the controversy. No one ever mentions it. Khomeini doesn't. Uh, it's all insult, hurt, justice. It's good secular language, and the problem is the problem of circulation in a way. Right. So the other thing that uh, is important to note is that such forms of outrage are globalized only by way of Europe. Um, and the interesting example here is the distinction between the Rushdie affair, which is the first of these. Right, where you have the globalization of um, outrage over insults to the prophet, and at the same time, what you have happening is the shift in countries like Britain from ethnic categories, like Asian or Pakistani national categories, to Muslim. Now, it's difficult to get back to Asian and Pakistani, uh, or you get back to them only in hyphenated ways. Muslim has become the de rigueur identity, the mark of identification.
that was not true until the 1980s. Um, uh, but why should this uh, order of outreach be globalized only through Europe? So it happens with Rushdie because of Europe. It doesn't happen with Taslima Nasreen, the Bangladeshi author uh, who is hounded out of her own country. And both the uh, Jamaat Islami, this group that had accused her of insulting Muslims and the Prophet, and indeed international media like the New York Times, uh, seemed complicit in trying to kind of create another Rushdie, you know, another global scandal. It doesn't happen. It only happens where the insult occurs in Europe. It doesn't happen when it happens anywhere else. You can have a local thing like the Slim and Asreen. She's now in exile in India. All right? And occasionally there is something that happens. Um, she, her life is not under threat, threat in any serious way. She lives publicly. Uh, uh, this, I think, is important perhaps because just as the figure of the theological also must come from Europe, um, the figure of the Muslim world, the idea of a global Muslim entity, also comes from Europe, also uh, is read through uh, Europe. And historically, you can see how that happens. Um, uh, the idea of a global Muslim ummah comes into being in the 19th century, again in the latter half of it, uh, on the model of the European empires, of the non-contiguous European empires like Britain and France. Um, uh, and this is very explicit. There's no idea of the Muslim world before then, and the Ummah was a juridical category, not a cartographic one. Right? But today, it has become a cartographic entity. Uh, so there are all these ways in which um, Islam and its globalization are twinned with Europe in interesting um, kinds of ways, just as uh, the language of global Islam can only be English, it can't be Arabic, it can't be anything else. Um, you remember the Danish cartoons, another example of the outrage over insults to the prophet. Uh, there you have, again, it happens in Europe, in a strange European country, for, uh, in some ways, uh, Denmark, uh, but it's only after assiduous uh, publicization um, that this becomes a kind of global issue, but it becomes that by way of English. Uh, it's only through English that this news item can be translated into Urdu, into Persian, into perhaps not Persian, into Turkish, into Bahasa, you know, Indonesia, into Malay, into all of these. Uh, the translations directly from, say, Arabic, are, the lines are too minimal to actually work. Um, so it's through Western media and it's through the idea of Europe itself. And so what I want to suggest is that if Islam can only recognize itself in and through Europe, um, it is not simply because of this history that I've recounted, but because Islam's very universality, its self-proclaimed universality, as embodied in this abstraction and uh, circulation that I began by describing, allows it to be taken over by others in a kind of theft. Um, and here you have another interesting form of thought. Uh, again, a late 19th century one. This idea that Islam is universal, but its universality is so great or intense that it can be taken over by someone else, that Muslims have to actually match up to it. So in the 19th century, you had important uh, liberal Muslim figures, like in India, uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, making this argument that, look, um, this is what our religion is. We fall short of it. But God says in the Quran that you know, Islam will be given to the best of communities. That doesn't need to be us. What if it's the British? What if it's the Europeans who are actually ahead of us in the game? Look at them. They are successful. They have developed science. They have done, they've conquered half the world. Maybe they are the true Muslims and not us. So we really need to run and catch up. All right? um, so that's from the liberal side of things, from the liberal capitalist side. From the, if you will, puritanical side, you have exactly the same argument. It's the same narrative that goes in completely different directions. So 
as uh, late as 2008, you have uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the heir, the successor to Osama bin Laden, making exactly this 19th century argument. So he's conducting a kind of dialogue on the internet with people, and someone asks him, uh, you know, you claim to be all for Islam, but look, you're using the internet, that's an invention of the West, and you are a doctor, and that's, you know, your, the medicine, medicine as you practice it is, of course, a Western science and all the rest. And he responds, that's true, but it's also irrelevant because uh, human capacities and abilities are universal. They don't belong to any particular group. Uh, indeed, what has happened is the practices and the ideas that we as Muslims gave rise to have been stolen for us, from us by the West. They have colonized us and they've taken our, what, our ideas and they have circulated them beyond us, uh, and we are unable to actually even reclaim them. When we reclaim them, in this case through violence, we share in the universality of these modes of analysis, uh, uh, activity, etc. So here is the idea of circulation and the universality it implies, it limbs, that is so capacious as to, rend as to minoritize the Muslims themselves within it. Uh, it's a language of theft, uh, um, uh, which needs to be therefore addressed. You must catch up to yourself. Um, Islam must be recovered precisely from the other, precisely from its enemy, um, in order for Muslims to be true to themselves. Now, what is called Islamophobia, interestingly, has a similar kind of narrative to it. If you look at the, this uh, famous novel of the French writer Hulebeck, you know, uh, and there are others, uh, he's not the only one. It's, it's this kind of narrative. We Europeans have lost out. Uh, we have become weak and effeminate. And uh, um, uh, it's these Muslims who now have the thrust and the, uh, the aggressiveness and the, the will to impose their ideas, who have taken this, stolen this duty from us, uh, and we need to recover it. Uh, it's always struck me as being a remarkably colonial idea. That is to say, an idea that comes out of colonization, of the, from the colonized, from the figure of the colonized. Uh, and it's not accidental because, of course, the other theme that is used in this narrative of Islamophobia is precisely colonization, of Muslim colonization of the West. So it's a nice mirror image to uh, the kind of uh, um, story that used to be told uh, from the end of the 19th century in countries like India and not only among Muslims um, about um, uh, the intimacy of the enmity uh, that, uh, that is uh, possible here. So the thing about the militant, of course, is that he is entirely familiar with his enemy uh, because he claims to share in what that enemy has. Uh, the reverse is true, of course, when you think about how in, in, in situations like the war on terror, the Muslim enemy is thought of as being opaque and foreign and strange. Um, but just as the strangeness uh, of modern Islam is, comes from the West in the form of blasphemy and other theological categories, um, so too does, um, uh, you can see that reversal made in, in, as I was saying, in Islamophobia. So the modern debate um, on insults to the prophet, of course, has always also been about uh, free speech, not only for Western critics, but for, I want to argue, the Muslim defenders of this as well. Um, and free speech is interesting because, of course, it's uh, modeled also or belongs also with ideas such as free trade. Um, very evident when you use terms like the marketplace of ideas, which needs to be preserved and all the rest. Circulation, precisely. Both are about circulation, both free speech and free trade, about circulation and abstract equivalence, where you can't actually make a judgment call because it's the prophet, as opposed to something else. Right. The particularity of the prophet is, should not be an issue. Um, but such markets, of course, are also defined by the very particularity that they seek to exclude. Uh, 
um, whether it is on the one hand in terms of free trade, drugs, arms, and counterfeit, those very particular things which should not be permitted to circulate, or in the case of free speech, that market, libel, defamation, uh, libel, defamation hate, and incitement, which are also those particularities which define otherwise the market of uh, the, the free circulation of equivalents. In both free trade and free speech, this makes for accusations of double standards, um, which is, of course, about false universality. You claim to be universal. You claim to be utterly neutral, but in fact, of course, you're not. Um, and in both cases, there are calls for protectionism, right? both in free trade and in free speech. The profit must be protected. So the profit must be removed from circulation uh, to become what? A Muslim property of a certain kind, but without, as I said, becoming an idol. So I want to just say something about two or three ways in which this happens, um, which I think are interesting. One has to do with um, an ongoing controversy over a group called the Ahmadis, uh, a 19th century group uh, which claims, or which is rather held by many other Muslims as claiming that its founder, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, uh, in the Punjab in India, uh, was a prophet. Um, and of course, Muhammad is meant to be the last prophet. Uh, so with the founding of Pakistan, the group was controversial from the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it, from the 19th century to that point in the early 20th, the controversies were not very great. They were just like other controversies. From the early 20th century, they become huge. Uh, in Pakistan, they were eventually declared non-Muslims. But the, the argument by which this declaration was made was really quite fascinating. They're not allowed to call themselves Muslim. They're not allowed to have structures of worship which look like mosques or are called mosques. They're not allowed to use words like Allah, etc. The fear is that they will seduce other Muslims, uh, that they are counterfeit Muslims. Right? So they are proscribed under the law of copyright and patent. No theological law. You know, Pakistan has, an ult there has a parallel Sharia system that is not involved in this. Right? So what do you do? As late as the 1970s, you say, Look, Islam is the property of its owners, of its uh, believers. And this counts as a breach of patent and copyright. Uh, this, is, uh, this is counterfeit. Uh, and because it can fool Muslims, uh, it must make its difference known, make its difference visible. It can't be. It can't look like a Muslim. It can't walk like and talk like and act like a Muslim. Uh, uh, and the... the so it's, it's, it's fascinating because, of course, the Ahmadi desires the reverse, right? It's to claim we are orthodox. So they are being proscribed not because they are different. They are being proscribed because they are too much like us. They are too similar. We can't tell the difference. Uh, that is the big problem. Uh, and it is, I want to argue, the problem that is made possible by what I'm calling this anxiety over circulation that goes well beyond control that destroys Islam itself. Um, uh, apart from this, you have uh, instances, for instance, in Indonesia, uh, ongoing controversy or over the use of the term Allah, God, which just means God. In Indonesia, you have riots over, or you have had them, over Christians and others using that word. Uh, even though in the Middle East, it's routine for Christians to use the word, it means God. Uh, in Southeast Asia, it's taken as a proper name and therefore it belongs only to Muslims. Um, and no one else can use it. Uh, and those who use it are trying to inveigle and seduce Muslims uh, because they are too much like them. So again, the anxiety of intimacy here. Uh, it's too, too much, it's too similar. Uh, we'll be sucked in, sucked out of ourselves, literally. Um, and yet, uh, similarly, a final example here uh, in India, and more in Pakistan, but increasingly in India as well, a commonplace term for a goodbye, which used to be Khuda Hafiz, God keep you, uh, now becomes Allah Hafiz, which makes no sense grammatically in Arabic. Uh, 
So Khuda, which is a Persian word for God, uh, is rendered into Allah, supposedly a proper name. Because, of course, Khuda could be anyone's God. You know, anyone could call their God Khuda, but only we supposedly can call him Allah. Uh, so an ungrammatical construction which makes no sense linguistically um, is, pushes out a centuries-old uh, ephemeral kind of farewell. I mean, there's nothing religious about it at all. God keep you. It's that kind of thing. Um, so here, these are three examples which I think illustrate the, uh, the problem of circulation and the desire to, of ownership, of withdrawing um, from circulation because of the seduction uh, that makes it possible to lose who you are to the other. Um, and yet, I want to argue that this is not about um, singularity or authenticity. Um, after all, Muhammad is one of a series. He's the final prophet in a series. He's not the one and only. He resumes and concludes that series. Uh, he's its end in that sense. But he's not unique. And as I was suggesting earlier, he's increasingly made into a vulnerable human figure, even less unique in a sense. Um, And yet he is also not deprived of his universality. He is the end of that series because unlike supposedly Jesus and Moses who are meant for particular groups of people, he is meant supposedly for mankind. Right? Of course, this is in some ways a Christian theme, um, the St. Paul theme, you, you might say. Uh, while God uh, unlike, say, the idol, is everywhere and so nowhere. Um, so both the prophet and God, God um, uh, while being removed from circulation, are not deprived or are not, are not meant to be deprived of the universal status. Uh, the prophet in this sense, as the end of the series, uh, and God, because he's everywhere and so nowhere, and perhaps it's precisely for this reason that he can only be known through the figure of the idol. It's only through the figure. The empty universality of God can only be understood um, through his opposite, uh, which is not like him, because it is the similarity um, and the logic of analogy and the simile which is so problematic here, right? which makes the expansion and circulation of idolatry possible in the first place. That is its language. Right? It's not, for instance, the language of, the, of metaphor, of the language of replacement, of one thing replaced by another or being represented by another. And yet there is a difference between the prophet and God. God doesn't fall into this uh, uh, narrative of insult. Um, why? might that be the case. The prophet can be insulted, but God can't be. Uh, the prophet, you can say, is, uh, you know, this is all about hurt and all the rest, recognition. Uh, God can only be counterfeited. Uh, is God then, in a way, more a part of this um, capitalist so sociality than Muhammad is? Uh, how is it that Muhammad, the human being, the person who, who can be identified as in, his, with, in his vulnerability, uh, is not uh, in some ways uh, as intimate as God can be? Uh, he doesn't function like a Jesus or a Mary. He's not a kind of mediating figure, in a sense. I want to argue. I want to, uh, um, rather the, the reverse. Uh, so there's a very popular Persian phrase uh, which goes, "Ba Khuda Divane Ba Ba Muhammad Khushyar." Go crazy with God, and be careful with Muhammad. Uh, the word for crazy, divane, uh, 
is the word used for passion, love, erotic, you know, in poetry, as all the Indians, at least in this room, will know. Um, what does it mean to say, be, go crazy with God, but be careful with Muhammad? This phrase is brought back in the Rushdie affair. Uh, so the most uh, interesting Muslim critic of Rushdie was a, philo a student of philosophy at Cambridge University called Shabir Akhtar, who wrote a book called Be Careful with Muhammad, precisely, invoking this phrase. So it's not a dead phrase. Um, you can do and say anything you like about God. It won't really incur much punishment. We have never yet seen a controversy, either local or global, in the name of God, uh, only in the name of Muhammad. Um, but as I was suggesting, I don't think this is because uh, Muhammad is somehow more intimate a figure and God isn't. Uh, rather, as I was saying, the reverse. Precisely because, and this again goes back to something William was saying about mana, precisely because God is everywhere and so nowhere, he is everything and so nobody, he is no one and so nobody, um, that he is the most intimate of figures. Uh, and the favorite shibboleth, if I can use that term, to illustrate that point is the is one that comes from the Quran and that is utterly has become a cliche. You know, God is closer to you than your own jugular vein. Right? He's really close, but he's obviously not so close as a person. It's not like the prophet. The prophet can't do that. Only God, because he's no one and so nobody, can be that close to you. Um, and that is also why you can go crazy with God, which is also why God can only be figured as a woman, as an infidel and as an idol, as Ghalib started by pointing out, because the Kaaba is the house of God. That's what it's known as. Uh, and indeed, I would like to suggest that God can only be imagined in the Islamic tradition as a woman. There is no other way of doing so as an idol. And again, everyone here who knows anything about Persian or Urdu poetry or Turkish or other uh, languages that tend to be used by Muslims and others is that all these harsh oppositional terms in Islamic theology, kafir, infidel, sanam or but, idol, these are all terms of endearment. That's what you call your beloved. That's what you also call God, right? God can be and is only capable of being a woman, an idol, and an infidel, just like your beloved, your lover, your mistress, whoever, is called those terms as well. You can go crazy with God because God is closer to you. Muhammad is like your family, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, as he was for those in the Rushdi affair. Uh, but he is not that. His problem is a different kind of problem. Um, so precisely because he is transcendent, formless, and universal, because he is nobody and nowhere, um, God is what is most intimate. This intimacy expressed in terms of the idol, as I was saying, the infidel and the woman, uh, none of whom can counterfeit him, precisely because they are not like him. It is the argument of similitude that is the problem. Um, they can therefore serve as God's truth, his secret truth, um, which brings us back, and uh, in, by way of conclusion, to Ghalib. Uh, in God, the idol remains, and the infidel and the woman remain central to Islam, but only on condition that she cannot be seen or generalized, that she cannot circulate. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for that brilliant paper. Uh, the floor is open now to questions. Thank you, Faisal. That was wonderful, really great. Um, I kind of, it's not really a question, more like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to pursue something which I take you to be saying and maybe clarify a little bit the stakes of it. I very much like this um, 
link that you were making between uh, sort of copywriting or branding in a way and the attempt to manage the idolatrous potential of the circulation of the figure, for instance, of the prophet. Um, because it seems like what you're saying is that that uh, gesture towards a kind of intellectual property or uh, proprietary branding, if you like, um, responds to the fact that both circulation and withdrawal risk producing idolatry, right? So the only possible solution can be a kind of uh, restricted circulation, or not even restricted in the sense of spati spatiality, because it's still going to circulate more and more, but a kind of, you know, this is a term I've used in my own thing, borrowed from uh, Annette Weiner, anthropologist, the kind of keeping while giving, right? So, so that you're holding onto it a proprietary claim at the same time that thing is, is being circulated, and so you can police its circulation. But of course then the circulation, as with brands, ends up always performatively producing these kinds of anxiety-inducing surfeits, right? So there's always these kind of excesses that get generated every time it circulates. Um, so it seems like the, I mean, the very formula, on the one hand, tries to produce a kind of radical imminence, so that you know, the, at some level the anxiety appears to be about, well, uh, I guess a sort of double one, like on the one hand, the, the, maybe this is what I'm asking you to, uh, to clarify, the relationship between overinvestment and false investment, right? Like overbelief, idolatry as overbelief or, or sort of excessive investment and idolatry as investment in the wrong thing or the wrong place uh, or the wrong name, uh, the wrong image and how this question of sort of the attempted control of that circulation addresses the difference between overinvestment and investment in the wrong thing. So maybe I'll just put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that is, it is very interesting. I mean, I think just to place it in a slightly different historical context, um, in a way, much of this is about the problem of what I was calling the proper name, which is the name of the Prophet on the one hand, Allah, the name of God on the other, but also of Islam itself. Uh, because it's only in comparatively recent times, perhaps a century and a half, uh, that I think Islam becomes a name of this kind. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are studies as early as the 1950s, Wilfred Cranfield Smith has wrote about how if you look at um, say the titles of Arabic books from the earliest time which have been compiled by medieval uh, uh, authors and add the modern ones it's only in the last century and a half that Islam actually even comes to figure in the titles of books you know it's just not there uh, it's not there perhaps because um, it it doesn't represent a proper, it isn't a proper name. Uh, he would argue that it is, it has a kind of adverbial quality to it. It's about an act rather than a thing, a being. Uh, but I would also like to think that it has to do with, um, with the, the problem that's inherent to property in any case or as such. Um, the Islam, Muhammad and Allah as proper names, uh, which are also forms of property that, as you were saying, need to be owned but cannot be owned um, either because either move destroys them. Uh, now, how those two modes of thinking, the excess on the one hand and the counterfeiting on the other, fit together um, is, uh, you know, is an interesting, it's, it's, it poses an interesting problem in its own right, I think, because it would be too easy 
to suggest, as I sort of did, that with God you have the problem of the counterfeit, and with the, prob with the prophet you have the, the other, the excess, excessive reverence and all that. How can you have excessive reverence for God? There's no way. There's no tomb. There's nothing. There's, you, know, you can't do it. Uh, and I think that's where, what's interesting. In a way, it's not the fact that, 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 they, that they diverge in terms of prophet and God, but that the problem raised by God is that the excess is impossible. Uh, you can't actually... So what you think is the problem at the level, say, of the prophet and other things, when you think about God, becomes an impossibility. It becomes unthinkable in some sense, because there is no excess worship of God. And perhaps in this, it is in this sense that God is both the most intimate because the most also destructive of self, the most excessive. Um, going back to my earlier point, when you kill yourself in a suicide bombing, you don't do so for the prophet. You do so always for God. You can, you can uh, protest in the name of the prophet. You can even die doing that, but you don't have this. Uh, you know, that's always God. To do it in the name of the prophet would be to render the prophet into an idol. All right? You can't. So again, the impossibility of the excess comes to mark both sides, which I think is really quite fascinating. Uh, but this is also why you can be divane, you can, be, you can go crazy with God. And if the apocalyptic comes in at all, it is with that, with the figure of God. Because as, a, as, a, as defining excess of these, these kinds, it is intimate because it is destructive, and it is intimate because it, uh, it, it, it is transgressive in every sense. That is why God is that I, an infidel and an idol and everything that he is not, everything that is his opposite. Um, and the prophet represents something quite different, perhaps a social order. Um, but I think the two serve as mirrors in some sense, and that the figure of God, the impossibility of the excess in God gets reflected back um, in the prophet for whom you therefore can't do things. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think I just have a sort of free association with that. I mean, I really like this phrase, the go crazy with God, be careful with Muhammad. And it actually reminds me of something that uh, Gilles Deleuze said about Christianity. That he had some line, it was something like that theology is the surrealism of philosophy. Um, the idea that you know, when you enter theology or, or when you talk about God, it's not that you have this like prohibitive, authoritative structure, uh, but actually that's the moment when your imagination can really run wild. In the sense, we, I wonder if you could even radicalize it. Like with God, everything is is you know permitted, and it's only with religion that everything is prohibited. In a certain sense, like I, I think there's a deep insight that nobody ever fights about God that one fights about like concrete, let's say, religious matters that are incarnated in specific texts or practices and so forth. Mm. But then, I get, it's not really a question, I just get confused then if I think, you know, the radical, so, you know, iconoclasm or that's anti idolatrous isn't the, it seems like there's a problem, I mean, it seems like there's a problem always with those those specific relig religious symbols, which one fights over, not over, always becoming kind of mm. idols in, in, in the way that you defend them so, mm. you know, vociferously. And is this use of this secular rhetoric of copyright, which is absolutely mm. fascinating, mm. is that a way out of this problem of idolatry? I, I guess that's what I'm trying to, that's where I don't quite understand if there's some contradiction, let's say, in, in, in the discourse today of Islam between like protecting the prophet but not wanting to idolize, and therefore using this language of a secular language of copyright, ironically, better serves the theological interest. Am, am I following you on this? Yeah, yeah. I no, I think Sorry. that's. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, that goes, of course, together what I was saying earlier about the uh, the non-employment of theological terms. No, I don't mean just in, in the copyright thing, but in general over protests, um, you know, blasphemy. Why does it only have to come through Christianity? Uh, 
why can it not come through Islam? It's not like there is no tradition of thinking about such things in Islam, but it never comes. It always has to be the other, who the out, you know, the uh, uh, the European, who um, uh, who is its point of origin. Um, and as I was suggesting, uh, you know, might we be able to think about the non-availability of blasphemy? or when it is invoked, but always attributed to another, uh, in terms of excess in another sense, um, whether it is uh, uh, the logic of supplementarity. Um, but I don't know if that works. So if you do the Deridian thing, then it, I don't think it really does, uh, because it's, it's named too clearly for one. Um, and it's... it's, it's um, its derivation is too clear in some senses. Uh, or on the other hand, whether we can think about it in terms of surplus, again, very clearly named in that sense. So it, the very clarity of it seems to be, um, doesn't inspire confidence in me, shall we say, um, though I offer these as, as, as possibilities. Because you can think about, as is true when, when the protests happen in the Muslim world, about such protests without using, the, like in, in the Pakistani case you were mentioning, where the theological category is never mentioned at all. So it doesn't act as supplement or excess or, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever. Um, it only happens when it happens in Europe. It only happens in interlocution, uh, where the translation requires, ironically, uh, uh, it's, in the tr it's in translation that the theological becomes uh, crucial. Um, uh, that only speaking to the rational West do you require the theological. But not, again, as a or self-orientalizing thing. I don't think that is um, uh, what's happening either. So, I mean, I, yes, you're right. I mean, I think the... Um, the uh, non-availability of the theological in a tradition which has plenty of it for this set of issues I think suggests the, how f deliberate the, uh, the, the fact of the capitalist nature of circulation and equivalence and all those things is for that it has to be constantly brought in front. It must be fully, uh, fully conscious. Uh, it's, so it's, it's not, um, that's why I'm saying it's not the, it's not about, at this level, mystification. Can I just try yeah. To, if I understand, I, I, it's very fascinating, but I thought about, did you, could you argue that the capitalist language actually allows Islam to solve a certain theological Hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I think that's, um, uh, yeah, I think that's very interesting. I mean, I, I, uh, one would then have to go back and see what the, the f f problems or the blockages are in trying to think, in trying to think this purely, if you, as, uh, as it were, theologically. So, no, I think what you're saying is very, very interesting. And what I have done is actually not try to address that level of the analysis, but um, run it through just historically uh, uh, with, capi with capital as the presupposition of it. I'd be interested in knowing uh, uh, your views you speak of Islam as if it was homogenous, which it isn't. So is, are those responses typically Sunni or would they be equally shared by the Shias and the other sects? And why are the Ahmadis singled out for, uh, because I mean in the past in, in Islam there's also been a problem with who's been the prophet. So why have they been singled out as being not, not Muslim? Yeah, I mean I... Well, the Ahmadis are not the only ones who get it in the neck, uh, as we know, uh, by looking today in Syria and Iraq, but and other places. Um, 
but for this set of debates, what I find interesting about them is that the, the difficulty they pose is the, the difficulty of closeness, of similitude, uh, which is not perhaps true of these other groups, uh, which you can easily say, oh, these, this is a heresy, and it's a heresy because they look, act, believe differently. Um, the thing about the finality of the prophet is also very interesting because a lot of the anti ahmadi literature draws upon as its ur text the controversy in the 1920s and 30s with the philosopher Muhammad Iqbal, philosopher and poet Muhammad Iqbal, who is anti ahmadi even though he's, he himself or his brother was ahmadi So there's a whole family politics there which one can also get into. And he makes a very interesting argument. So here is a man who studied in, at Cambridge with the English Hegelian MacTaggart and then went and did his PhD at Munich before the First World War. Uh, and he makes this kind of argument that Islam uh, is defined by the finality of prophecy. And what that means is that the prophet that Muhammad realized that he was the final prophet because human freedom was only possible once access to God was cut off. That is the meaning of finality for him. So once you abolish yourself, which is what Muhammad did, which is, if you will, a kind of interesting prefigurement of the sacrificial, non idolatrizing you know, I am only a man, I will abolish myself. Um, once you do that, then humanity steps into, in Iqbal's view, into the breach. Humanity becomes a historical subject for the first time with the finality of the prophet because God is no longer accessible, there is no divine. And the problem with the Ahmadis then for Iqbal is that they bring God back. It's not about Mirza Ghulam Muhammad as saying I'm a prophet. Uh, it's that once you reconnect the link with God, then you can no longer have human freedom. So the, the, the argument, even at a theological level, is which so this is a semi-theological argument. It doesn't draw entirely from Islamic hermeneutics, but it's what's fascinating about it that the the Orthodox Muslim guys who are, you know, rioting and the Ahmadis must be declared non-Muslim, their argument is that um, the Ahmadis bring back God and God cannot come back uh, because we cannot have human freedom. Uh, this is the threat that they also, the semi-theological threat that they face. So in a way, the Ahmadi thing is quite distinctive. Um, I think that um, uh, there are, of course, um, other kinds of narratives which have to do with, say, Shiism. You know, obviously, when I'm using the term Islam, I'm not, I'm not using it homogeneously to refer to what all Muslims are or think, but the way in which the term itself is deployed in particular kinds of, uh, of, uh, of narratives. And the, one of the points I want to make is how you can get from the same narrative entirely opposed political trajectories or conclusions or directions. Um, so you can get, which is what I was starting to say, you can get the kind of pro-Western liberal guys on the one hand from the 19th century with this rhetoric of theft and catching up and all the rest. And on the other hand, you can get Amal al-Zawahiri and al-Qaeda. It's the same reasoning. That doesn't mean that they are, you know, that poor old Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was a like, closet jihadist or that the jihadist is a potential liberal. Uh, but I find it fascinating how the, the whole debate over this, these kinds of issues shares. It doesn't, it doesn't bifurcate at the narrative level. Um, it then becomes about um, is, of issues of intensity or apparently quite minor forms of interpretation. And I find that quite fascinating. Why should that be the case? Uh, why is it as in the smallest items? Um, that the biggest differences uh, become possible or inevitable. Hello. Hello. I have certain questions to ask. Uh, starting with uh, Ghalib's verse, I mean, does he actually, in, in the verse, in the way you have interpreted it, stand for status quo 
and maybe as opposed to that argument, uh, stand for stalling the exploration at that level, uh, leaving everything which is uh, inherent to the identity of Muslim as it is. I mean, the mention of uh, Makkah in the verse, I feel is a referent metaphor for uh, what you uh, call in, 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 the, uh, in this book, uh, an inner conflict in Islam, which are posing uh, a threat from within. Uh, interpretation or criticism of idolatry uh, through this verse is, I, I believe, uh, very misleading. And the accusation always comes from accusation of idolatry always comes from outside of the religion. Uh, and next question is uh, about the difference between uh, obeisance and deification, and what exactly does now Makkah mean to Muslims? If you could uh, elucidate on on this argument. Well, thank you. I don't know if I. I, really I have can. another question, sir. I have one more question to ask. Yeah. So, um, about uh, uh, Melodicia and uh, you know about uh, uh, what you talked about suicide bombing and other things. In in a conflict like Palestine and Kashmir and uh, Chechnya, how do you see their rebellion as, which of course is local to those geographies, but is Islamic in its outlay? So, I mean, in, in that sense, I mean Islam, in which how it sort of Islam mobilizes that. Okay, could you remind me of the second one? So, the first question is about idolatry coming in from the outside. And what was the second about one? About Ghalib's um, uh, verse, interpretation of verse. I think you have sort of misinterpreted that verse. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, which verse? The verse I began with. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, the thing I wanted to say about Ghalib, and, and this deals with, I guess, the first and second questions uh, about idolatry, is that what's interesting about Ghalib is that he, rather than keeping the two, as I was saying, uh, separate, but side by side, you know, the, the there and the haram, the temple and the mosque, which is true of poetry, uh, which is the kind of standard thing where you have the there or haram. The, they're paired, but they are separate. And the there, the temple, is always more about divinity than the haram. The mosque is always kind of in Persian and Urdu poetry. Nothing good is ever said about mosques, right? They're always bad places. They're always places where you can really nothing happens. Uh, the true place for erotic as well as spiritual enrichment is always the temple and the idol and who is also of course God. So God is to be found there, not in the mosque. What Ghalib does is he superimposes one on the other. Uh, he's not the only one who does that, but I think in this verse he does it quite interestingly. But he's using kind of, if you will, as you put it, the, log, the form of the metaphor, which is not what, the, um, what these later Muslim uh, because, f figures use. They use a kind of uh, um, uh, similitude, similes, and things like that, you know, to, and in a way, if you, you can think about it as the logic of analogy, which is itself a kind of legal way in which Islamic law uh, chaos, right, in which Islamic law proceeds by analogy. So you say, here, you know, we are told that um, uh, Jews and Christians are people of the book because they share a book. What, do, what are we to do with Zoroastrians and Hindus or Buddhists? Well, they can be like people of the book if you can somehow find a book, or they can be like people like the people of the book, and then they can be assimilated in that way. All right? So very uh, per, uh, legalistic form of this is like this. And it's, it's this, it seems to me, uh, logic that um, informs a lot of the conversation about circulation and idolatry, right? So this is like an idol. What Ghalib is doing is, it, what is interesting about what he says is that the idol is only possible after the expansion or the circulation of the idol is only possible after its destruction. Um, and it is that which makes the Kaaba itself into an idol. Uh, and rather than dest the destruction of the idol universally, you know, makes it infinitely malleable and it, it circulates everywhere, including within Islam itself. The problem is, how do you prevent that from being, well, it must remain the secret. Uh, that is how it functions, it serves as the truth, that, that God can only be known by his opposite, which is not like him as its truth. That 
I think nicely poses a kind of question, but the subsequent, uh, so I'm not saying what Ghalib is, Ghalib is not part of the problem of the circulation of idolatry. He's still part of that old world in which but the... Maybe the, he, might, he might not have exactly used it, you know, sort of written the verse in that way, maybe he might have taken a dig at it, you know, at, at the way he was, you know, because he was, um, you know, uh, he was a drunkard in a way. He was a? He used to drink. Uh, it was uh, prohibited in Islam. I don't mean it in a derogatory way, of course. So uh, maybe he might have taken a dig at it that way, and that's why he wrote the verse. It could be interpreted that way also. Yeah, I, I mean, I, one can't tell. Except, you know, I'm only interpreting it in the way that, the in the way in a quite standard, in some senses way. Yes, I mean, then also in the next question you could explore that, you know, about idolatry, about because I, there I ask about. Um, Obeisance and uh, deification. What's the difference between them? Yes. I mean, I think the... Um, that's actually quite interesting because um, the idol is one to whom you pay obeisance and you shouldn't. Uh, do you, I, do, is the idol someone or something that is deified? I suppose so, but the the language of deification is generally attributed to human beings uh, where and there is a, a lengthy kind of um, history of this someone claiming to be God so let me give you an example uh, from Maududi who is one of the leaders uh, of those who sought to declare the Ahmadis non-Muslim right so he is the preeminent Islamist of modern Islam, right? He comes practically first, and all the others, like Khomeini and Sayyid Qutb, read him, right? So he's crucial. Indeed, the, much to my amazement, the caliph, uh, the new caliph in Iraq, Syria, in his first speech, extensively and fulsomely quotes Modudi. The Modudi would have been horrified. The Modudi is the guy who wants Islamic State, Islamic Revolution, and all that. It's a kind of Cold War moment. But so Modudi um, says this interesting thing. This is about deification. Uh, and it's another example of how, when you think things are working in a purely theological way, they might not be. All right? So he says about sovereignty uh, that the Islamic State uh, cannot entertain the sovereignty of any man, assembly, or institution because sovereignty belongs only to God. So he's instrumental in making sure that in the Pakistani constitution, sovereignty belongs to God. Right, not to the people. Uh, what? Why does he say that? This is entirely new. That no one had ever thought of this sort of thing before. He invents a new word for it, hakimia. Uh, he says this because then he's quoting Blackstone and Hobbes. All right. He says, "Look, if you look at the theory of sovereignty, it is so absolute. It can only be predicated of a divine being. Uh, so." The problem with sovereignty is not that if you have a king or a parliament that they have become absolute, but precisely because they can never match up to the theory. They fall short of it all the time. So the problem with sovereignty is that it becomes violent precisely because it can never be absolute, because it can never attain to its own theory, uh, which is why only God can be sovereign and not man. Uh, so the theological element in here you see is, is, is it's fascinating because he's saying for him it's not as in the way in which so many commentators of Schmidt take it that you have an, you know, some pre-existing theological category and then it somehow just comes into secular life. It's the opposite. For Maududi it is the, the sovereignty can only be thought of as theological in a secular sense, in a in secular terms, uh, because it couldn't have existed before, because there was no such thing. All right, it's only retrospective. Uh, so it, that person who claims to be sovereign is the person who's deified, or that assembly that claims to be sovereign to represent the people. That is how deification works. So it works in this kind of back to front way. Uh, it's not the deification doesn't come from the past, from the realm of theology.
to insert itself. It comes from the future. It comes, or rather, it is precisely because uh, the secular theory of it requires, uh, uh, requires it that it becomes theological, if you see what I mean. So that's where, that's one example, but one very important example of the way in which a term like deification, man becoming God, becomes thinkable in modern Islam. And the examples, other examples of it, of course, are innumerable. The Pharaoh, you know, uh, who therefore is drowned. I don't know, all kinds of people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, Tower of Babel, the usual, the usual things. Uh, so uh, that is not the logic of idolatry. And last question about uh, uh, in a conflict like uh, Palestine and Kashmir and Chechnya, uh, how do you see that uh, those uh, rebellions as which... Uh, or local to that, those ge geographies, but are in are Islamic uh, in its outlay. I mean, Islamic in the way that in, in how they being mobilized. I don't are, are they real? I mean, are they real emancipatory moments? I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, there. I think also the problem is how do you distinguish what's Islamic from. It's a real anxiety, you know. Is this Islamic? Is this not Islamic? Is this simply an, you know, is this an Islamic name? On it's something Modi also faced when you have this idea of an ideological state, uh, and well, it's like a communist ideological state, except you'll call it Islamic. You have a constitution. Well, it's like a Western constitution, except you'll call it Islamic. What, what is happening there? Uh, I think the deeper problem with Islamic politics is the refusal of the political itself. Uh, so, again, starting from someone like Maududi, the issue with sovereignty is this, after all. Uh, if you don't have sovereignty, the whole problem, the whole thing, when you say sovereignty belongs to God, what you're saying is that God has disappeared. After all, the prophet is gone. He was the last one. You have a society that runs itself without sovereignty. That is what the sovereignty of God means. And it, that's what it means in the Pakistani constitution. It is not delegated. It's just there. Um, uh, it, it, it's there because it, it cannot exist, in a sense. And the, the great obsession, fantasy of Islamism is of having a self-running society without sovereignty, in a way a non-political. Islamic law is Islamic law precisely because it's meant to serve as a kind of second nature. It is nature remade. Uh, it runs itself, and those who are in charge of it are always outside the state, people like Maududi. They are not meant to be in positions of authority in the state. They're in in Islam, is thought, not in Iran, that's a different thing, but it's Shiite thing, but they're outside. Now, you can see the historical derivation of it. Um, you know, people like Gandhi think about this social self-management, Swaraj, right? But also, Maududi explicitly refers to Lenin. Uh, like Gandhi does, when Gandhi was asked what he thought of Lenin, he said, I would begin where he ended with the withering away of the state. Uh, you know, this is my beginning point. The state is evil. Society must run itself. Uh, and Modudi, who had after all written an adulatory biography of Gandhi in his early days, is also, and he's explicitly, he's even more Leninist. He models his, as famously known, his mod he models the Jamaat Islami party on the Bolshevik party. He tells you, all right? So the problem with Islamic politics is the politics bit of it, uh, I think. Uh, we have questions. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that was brilliant. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, the, you know, the, the, the suggestion that um, capitalism is a way in which uh, Islam provides a resource through which Islam can resolve a theological problem. And uh, it's, it seems to me that this problem is about the relationship between the name of God and the name of the prophet. It's about the relationship be between these two names. And there is, in theology, this is a problem because um, it's about the relationship between um, uh, univocal signification and equivocal signification mm -hmm. and the resource of analogy in being able to talk about the relationship between God and his creatures. The problem is that um, Muhammad is a proper name, mm -hmm. whereas God is neither mm 
it's not a common noun, um, but it cannot be a proper noun like any other proper noun, because no finite creature can name God. There's no act of naming that is appropriate to God's infinity. Um, it seems to me that the withdrawal from circulation that you described in this dialectic of iconoclasm, the withdrawal from circulation is equivocal. And this is the root of the problem. And it's equivocal because on the one hand, the, sub the, uh, uh, the, sub the instance which is subtracted from circulation, the subtraction from circulation resacralizes the subtracted instance as unrepresentable. And this is God as that which is beyond every finite predication. But on the other hand, um, the subtracted instance is, has, is desacralized as human in the figure of the prophet who must be pr protected from injury as, so as not to be sanctified as such. Mm. But this desacralization re-sanctifies him as an icon of collective vulnerability. Mm. Um, and this sanctifying desacralization is inscribed within capital because it be, it, it, it's, it's commensurate with the, the commodity fetish because it, becomes, it allows the commodification of injury. Whereas the prophet becomes the representative or the emblem of our collective injury. Um, so this is why, and this leads to the second stage where you said that Islam's universal, universality is so absolute or so, um, you know, so unconditional that it, it, it's, it's, uh, it can be appropriated by infidels. Hmm. So that the, the task for, for militant Islam becomes a violent reappropriation of this expropriated universality through the medium of secular desacralized universality, which is to say technology hmm. and finance. Hmm. Um, and here, the problem is this, is that if, um, if you don't sort out you know, the way in which God signifies, the name of God signifies, then God's infinity or God's universality becomes um, indistinguishable from money. Because the way in which God is unlike everything else is the way in which money is as universal equivalent yeah. is unlike anything else. Um, so then the problem is about the, um, if so long as you don't, so long as you have this kind of opposition between, uh, so, uh, between univocal and equivocal signification, um, God, God's name becomes a proper name for the sacralization of an unnameable exception, which is his impropriety, which is why it's possible to go mad with God, mm -hmm. which is why you can say anything you want about God, whereas Muhammad becomes a proper name for the sacralization of propriety, which is in, you know, injury. Hmm. Um, if, that, if, you, if you remain at that level, then our finitude, the finitude of creatures, the injurability of creatures, represents God's invulnerability, his uninjurability. Hmm. Um, and the only way in which, and so the resource of analogy then is pre precisely to stop this, um, the, uh, is, is to prevent the reintroduction of, you know, a representative relationship between our vulnerability and God's invulnerability. Um, and this, this uh, it's precisely an analogy, the resource of analogy, which blocks because an analogy allows you to specify the way in which God is unlike anything else. Without that specification, then it seems to me... So, you know, all I'm trying to say is that um, if you don't sort out your theology carefully in advance, um, you, you know, the political consequences, you, know, you end up in this kind of... Uh, well, it seems that the... Uh, the uh, uh, the, path, you know, the, the problem, the problematic you, you outlined is a symptom of a, of a kind of a, you know, a theological kind of failure. So that the, and the way in which the kind of the politics ends up, uh, you know, actually exacerbating, you know, the very thing mm. against which it's struggling to, to free mm. itself. Mm. Um, thank you. No, well, th I wish I'd said it so well myself. Uh, I think... Um, uh, no, I, I entirely agree, um, and you know, I'm wondering. So that the one thing, small thing that bothers me is, you know, what I mentioned about uh, 
the attempt to render the name of God into a proper name in, say, Southeast Asia. And I think it's too simplistic to simply say, oh, you know, they don't know Arabic, so they take it to be a proper name. Uh, so I'm, I, I mentioned it, but I left it because I don't know how quite to fit it, how it might fit in. But one way in which this relationship of the of propriety and impropriety, of vulnerability and invulnerability uh, can be looked at perhaps is something I was talking to Nadia about um, the other day when thinking about um, and I mentioned this briefly family and genealogical links and this also goes back something to what you know, Slavoj Žižek said yesterday about the deracinated character of Islam, you begin from but zero. Um, there's certainly something to that, but you know, God is, God famously, of course, in Islam has, there's the whole kind of strangely besides the point uh, critique of Christianity. Uh, God can have no son, he has no, you know, all the rest. Uh, that is what allows God to be a woman in some senses, a sterile woman, and um, uh, uh, there, therefore a beloved, because there's never a possibility of fruitfulness, if you will, and that the relationship with the beloved in, say, poetry is always, um, uh, always excludes the possibility of reproduction. Uh, whereas Muhammad, who even though he is the orphan and he also doesn't have a son, so there's a nice parallelism here. Uh, God doesn't have a son, Muhammad doesn't have a son. He does in fact have a son who dies, uh, but there can be no successor except, and this is the link back to God, through a woman. So Shiism as we know is all about the succession of Muhammad that succession can only occur by way of his daughter Fatima. Now the, the kind of uh, flat-footed historical way of dealing with it is to say, ah, you see Muhammad's son died and they had to figure out some way of ensuring the transfer of authority and you know the Sunnis do it in this council and it goes to his father-in-law and then to other people and the Shiites say, no, we want lineal succession. Fine, that may or may not have been the case. The important point is uh, the Shiite claim of the Imam is all men, but the origin is always a woman. It's, the, it's Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. I don't see why this has to be the case, because Ali, the first Imam, was already related to Muhammad. He was already his son-in-law and his cousin. I mean, his cousin, and, and you know, so he, okay, he's his son-in-law that presumes the daughter, but he's also his cousin, so he's pre-related to Muhammad, quite apart from marrying his daughter. I think the figure of the woman is, is um, conceptually important here. Uh, and that, in a way, might be the link with the, the figure of the childless God who is a woman, on the one hand, and the figure of the childless prophet, the sonless prophet, who can only be succeeded through uh, a woman. The prophet still is not a father. He is Fatima's father, but he is called, we were discussing this, you can say of the Prophet that he is my father and mother. Only an individual can say it. It's not a collective thing. So he has both sexes. He's a man and he's a woman. Uh, you can say of his wives, as is often said, they are Ummahatul Ummah, they are the mothers of the believers. So his wives, in the plural, are mothers of the Muslim community. The prophet is both the mother and the father, but only of singular people, not of the community. That gets into the problem of idolatry if you make him the mother and father of the community. That would be the, what God cannot do, what God is not the father. Uh, um, and I, I'm just wondering whether we can think of in this entirely, if you will, theological language, the. Uh, the, if transposed into the world of capital, the links that you are pointing out between 
of complementarity or supplementarity between God and Muhammad, you know, the vulnerable and the invulnerable. Uh, uh, if that becomes thinkable through the the language of family genealogy and succession, uh, and how circulation might or does it fit into uh, fit into that? Uh, the circulating item, in a way, is the woman in both cases. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of work, more work can be done than I have done or can do on this on this subject. But just by way of offering another, as it were, lens onto what you were saying. Do we still have time? Uh, first, really, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I really so many uh, important points. And actually, to some extent, what I want to introduce into the debate, you already did uh, in answering the, this question, namely the, the notion of politics. Hmm. And uh, perhaps I would begin by saying this, what you said, the problem with Islamic politics is the politics bit. And is it not that this is, we could also say for the past, I don't know, almost 50 years, that the problem with the European politics is also the politics mm. bit. There, there is yeah. no European policy yeah. for, and perhaps this kind of, uh, there is this kind of constitutive resonance. You mentioned Europe as the place through which uh, this kind of a conflict crystallized, or the, the kind of new entity, new way of thinking uh, about uh, this conflict, uh, and new names appeared. And I think uh, also that there is an interesting parallel between what you said in the case of, of Rajdi, that the theological discussion was not at all um, there, but instead you had this other hurt, injury, insult uh, 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 vocabulary. And I think it's precisely, this is precisely how you could also define capitalism, but instead of theology you have politics. I mean, if you don't address the political side of the problems, they appear, I mean, if you don't address them as political problems, mm -hmm. they appear as problems of hurt, injury, uh, injustice. And this is also what happened in Yugoslavia. I mean, mm -hmm. this is where Europe started kind of falling apart mm -hmm. politically. Mm -hmm. Because the only way it could see what was happening there was not mm -hmm. at all in political terms, but in terms of these religious wars, ethnical things we cannot really understand, which were absolutely not there before. This discourse kind of gave them the only framework that uh, appeared. So uh, I think there is a kind of interesting parallel and the, the fact that precisely capitalism um, doesn't want to repress the very political dimension of the problems. Mm. It, it, and this, perhaps there is this kind of affinity mm. that could be. Explain. No, yes, thank you very much. I, I, I entirely agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, my two cents worth for the ex-Yugoslavia, I think that's exactly right in so many ways, not least because for Islam, because that's where the modern language of jihad comes from, and that's where the modern language of the caliphate comes from. It's the first instance of people going in, you know, foreign fighters, as it were, in that case, of course, encouraged, um, uh, and also it's the first time, I think, since the abolition of the caliphate that the caliphate comes back as a real possibility. Uh, in the, I mean, I remember I was a student in the, in the US then, and there were all kinds of things, including a group like California. <laughs> California. Okay. There is apparently some uh, etymological connection there. <laughs> so that's, of course, ridiculous. But I remember reading, uh, uh, you know, like a text by Izzet Begovic. Uh, fascinating because he says, and this was a text apparently that was then taken up by the Milosevic regime to show that Izabegovic is this kind of crazy Islamic guy. And he says, uh, between Turkey and Pakistan, what should be our model? And weirdly for me, he chose Pakistan. <laughs> um, and Well, Turkey at that time, of course, secular state and uh, Muslim majority secular state. He chooses Pakistan, the state in which sovereignty belongs to God. In, in which politics has supposedly been erased. Uh, and it's so already there in the Yugoslav conflict, in the way in which it reaches out to global precedents, you, you see something of the sort. And I suspect, certainly with the, the, what I was saying about the, the mirroring uh, 
relationship between the sort of colonial language of theft and recovery and the Islamophobic language. Um, in a Europe where, as every second FT article reminds us of, sovereignty doesn't exist, or traditional sovereignty doesn't exist, or if it does, it exists only in the form of NATO, uh, post-Yugoslav war. Um, and so uh, that allows post-Brexit Britain, for instance, to say, that's OK. Uh, we are still part of the sovereignty of Europe, uh, whatever that might be. Because actually, it's vested not in Brussels. It's vested in NATO. Um, uh, and that is the only way we, you know, it becomes thinkable uh, uh, in the um, because it only has, it has last instance meaning or first instance meaning generally these days in terms of war, borders, um, uh, and whether of uh, military incursion or refugee incursion or any migration, anything. Um, uh, and so I'm just wondering how it might be possible to think about Europe, on the one hand, without politics, as you say, and on the other hand, NATO as the only political manifestation of Europe, but which can never utter its name, which can never actually present itself as the sovereign that defines uh, Europe. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back and we'll reconvene at 4 o'clock after tea. Thank you. Thank you.